All right. So in week two, um, we are going to be dealing um, a lot with with just queries and queries are kind of the bread and butter of SQL. And I hope you've got the chance to watch um, some of the videos I posted in the announcement. And if not, um, no worries. I, I do think that they're like a great kind of very brief intro um, to, to the whole thing. So so I recommend it. Um, but if not, we're going to do a lot of talking about it here. Um, this week, we're going to do a lot of like actually experimenting. This is the week where we're going to really start to kind of like use the stuff that we're talking about, um, which will be good. Um, real quick, just to make sure that I knew we were hitting everything, wanted to real quickly go over just the PowerPoint here real quick. Um, <clears throat> And, and and as we skim, I'll I'll kind of do some explaining. So um, in the SQL language, um, there's different clauses and um, or, or statements, I should say. Sorry, there's different statements. And in a select statement, a statement is is like one snippet of code. So whenever we execute code against the database, they really execute in in singular statements. Um, and each statement, you know, you can make a list of statements to kind of create a script, so to speak. Um, it's very step, you know, we go step by step in databases. Um, and so um, a select statement is just one of those. Um, and inside each select statement there, there's different clauses. And those are kind of just fancy word for, for syntax. Um, so uh, the, kind of the most basic SQL statement you can have um, let me pull up Workbench because um, the most simple select statement you can have is actually just a select. So we can um, just do something as simple as select hello world. And notice we're not even going to put a from clause. We're just going to we're just going to do that and execute it and you'll notice that it just says uh, hello world. So that's kind of like the hello world of the, the database world is, is just select hello world. Um, and then from there we can kind of layer on. So that's kind of like the base of what you need. You need to select something. Um, and then from there we can kind of layer on. So from there we can say from where. So if we wanted to take this um, to kind of the next level, we could say, oh, I want to select everything, and asterisk means everything, FYI, um, from, and let's take a look at the customer table. So if I select everything from customer, I'm selecting all of the columns and subsequently all the data from customer. So here's basically just a massive export, essentially, all the data um, in the customer table. Um, so the from clause tells us where are we getting our data from? Now, one thing I'd like to point out is that when these queries actually execute, um, there is an order to them and it's not the order it's written. Um, and I think, um, I guess a little background, SQL was originally written to be um, the idea of the people who came up with SQL language syntax, their ideas that, hey, we're gonna make this so easy that normal business people can, can do it, um, which is kind of funny because um, you know, people like us eventually or do have jobs because they, they won't. So, um, but that's why it's, it's going to be written out of order from the way that the data processes, but understanding the order in which it processes is extremely important. And that's kind of what I want to go through as we do this. So imagine you're, you know, cause, cause ultimately when we run a select statement, we're just fetching data from a database, right? Um, and so imagine that you have a picture like a filing cabinet, right? Or really a row of filing cabinets, um, you know, and, and, you know, if we're going to go find some data in this set of filing cabinets, you know, the first step is we need to know where are we getting our data from? Um, so like, let's say that we have this massive row of filing cabinets, and let's say that each cabinet drawer is a letter of the alphabet. Right, so we have a long range of filing cabinets, and each drawer is a letter of the alphabet. Um, so the first step we might want to know is like, hey, you know, I'm getting my data. Well, first, you know, we're getting our data from the filing cabinets that hold all these records. 
um, which is probably step one, right? So we're going to look for customer records and we know all the customer records are in those filing cabinets. So the from clause is the first thing that executes. We need to basically have all the data at our disposal. In this example, our filing cabinets. The next step is we filter out unwanted data with the where clause. So in this example, let's say we, you know, we're looking for um, someone with the last name of white or last name is equal to white. Right. Okay. So there we go. Now we, you know, we're looking for Betty White. Right. So we say where last name is equal to white. We're looking for all the whites. In this case, it just happens to be one. So any select statement that uses data from an actual table and filters data is going to be based on, on these three, select, from, and where. So no matter what query you write, if it has a where clause, it will execute in that order. So from and then the where clause. So, and, and actually select is the very last thing. So from, where, and then select. Now, the, keep in mind, this is all conditional on you having those. So obviously if you don't have a from clause, select's gonna be the first thing to run. So from, where, and then select. Now, I'm gonna skip two of these for right now um, because they're they're a little bit more complex. So I kind of want you to actually kind of just don't think about those for right now. Um, and we're going to jump straight into the order by. So let's choose a different last name, one that has multiples. Smith, uh, they don't have one either. Uh, let's look for everyone whose last name starts with an, an S and then see what we get. There we go. So now I have all these people whose last name starts with an S. Um, so from, from here, what we want to do is we want to order. So I'm going to say order by, and let's say I want to sort by last name, then first name. Last name, then first name. And so now you can see that our last name is going to be sorted alphabetically and then our first name within that. So um, I don't know if we have any duplicates here. And so the first name sort doesn't really make a lot of sense. So um, let's sort instead by active and then first name. So now we're going to have all of our actives up at the top. We don't have any inactives. So, and then you can just see that the first name is sorted alphabetically from A clear down to W. And so in this case, it's going to go from, where, order by, and then the select clause in that order. And, and so this is kind of what I consider like kind of your base query. So just for context, the group by and having clauses, this is only when we want to do something called aggregation, which is when we take many rows and we turn it into one. Um, so a good example of this would be to say, hey, you know, we have all of these and, and just, you know, like we're going to cover the, the group, the aggregation in a later week in detail. So I don't want you to get too lost on this, um, but I want you to know what it is. So when you see it, you're not confused, but um, aggregation is when we take multiple rows and we turn them into fewer or into one, so to speak. Um, so for example, if we take a look at inside of our Sequila database, we have this uh, transaction table. So if I take a look at what's inside this transaction table, transaction, we can kind of look here and, and you'll see that there's these, oh, and that's actually the wrong one. Sorry, you may not have the transaction table yet. We'll get there. It's a payment, select everything from payment. So we have all these payments and these are people who have rented a movie from our stores. You know, we can see their rentals, um, which if we wanted to, and later we will, we'll tie all this together so it makes sense. But we do know from this table, we have an amount that they paid and the date that they paid. Um, so like if, if we're in business and we want to say, oh, how much revenue did we have in each given month? You know, we would have to take this and 
add up by based on the month, right? Because we have the date, um, so we could turn that into a month. Now, you know, we could just export this and I'm sure, you know, do a pivot table in SQL, but um, what if we want to do it here, right? So what we can do is we can take the year of payment date and we can take the month of payment date. And then finally we can get the sum because we want to add all of it up, just like in Excel, we want the sum of amount. And I'm going to call this revenue as revenue. Um, so if I were to run this right now, it's actually going to throw an error. It says um, that in an aggregated query without a group by expression, because we have to tell the computer essentially how we want to group this by. And in this case, we want to group by, and I'm going to cheat here just a little. Well, let's do this so it doesn't get confusing. We're, we want it grouped by, because we want the sum by year and month. Right. So that way we can kind of see like, oh, what was our what was our monthly revenue? So if I run this now, now we can see, oh, you know, and and, and let's, you know, in 2005, May, we did four thousand eight hundred twenty four dollars. Um, so if we want to take this another step further, because you can see that's kind of like all out of order here on our month, um, we can say order by and I want to group by year and then by month. So column one, column two. You can also put the names there if you wanted, but I'm just gonna do that for now. And there we go, 2005. So you can kind of see our, our revenues there. Um, <clears throat> so this is this is called aggregation and, and it's all based on this because we have this sum function um, that sums up it all. We're taking many records and we kind of saw that when we selected everything from the payments. We're taking all of those individual payments, you know, each customer spending money with us, and we're going to aggregate it or combine them, sum them up into a subset of records. So in this case, we turn many records into one, two, three, four, five, five records that kind of sum up. And, and so that you see this group by clause here, this is kind of the magic behind the, the sum function, because we have to say, hey, I'm summing up the amount and I want it by I want the sum, the amount grouped by year and month. So that's kind of what the group by does. And having is just, I like to consider the having clause as the where clause of, of aggregation. So we could say having a sum of amount greater than, let's say a thousand bucks. And this thousand this will eliminate this, this last row because basically we're saying, hey, I only want to see rows that have more than $1,000 in the total. So we can just do away with that. And there we go. Because if we tried to do that in the where clause, it wouldn't work because remember our group order of operations, right? We have our from clause, then our where clause. Because step one, if we go back to our filing cabinet, is we gotta know where it is. Okay, we're in this, you know, bin of drawers and we want to go find things. So like back up to here, hey, I wanna go find everybody whose last name is S. So I go and I look through and I say, okay, I don't care about anything except for where their last name's S. So you pull that drawer, grab all those files and that's your data. And that happens before the select clause, right? So from and then where. So let's say back to this example, let's say we only wanted to see um, the payments where the last name is equal to S and I'm not gonna write it because it would get too complicated for right now. Um, but you know, back to our filing cabinets, we would take that stack of all those receipts and we would put them on there and you know, it would be a manual process, but we'd have to go one by one and add up all the receipts. Um, but, you know, first we had to get the data we wanted before we could sum it all up. So basically what we do is we, we would follow that same process. And so we have to have this having clause for any, you know, if we want to filter the sum or the filter, the, the final value, what we add up or whatever we do to aggregate, um, we have to use this having clause because we do that after the fact. So if we have all these, it goes from where, then we group it all, and then we filter some out, 
the having clause, and then we order it, and then we display it. Because the funny thing about select statements is even though we put like certain things up here. So if I would just want first name and last name from customer, even though I do this and it only shows these two columns, all of the data is sitting there. We only chose to display certain bits of it. So that's why the select list is always last because it's more about display than it is about actual functionality. Now, that being said, when we aggregate, it can have an effect on, on how the computer does the rest of this, but that's why you need the group by, because really the group by is the, the key thing that kind of groups the data up and the sum just determines, hey, how do I handle the stuff we, we added up? So in this case, is it add? Is it um, an average? You know, we could switch this just as easy to, to average and and pull kind of like that average amount. And you'll notice that that didn't work because we're having, um, and let's see, I'm getting an error. Oh, it's because I have this where clause. There we go. And you'll notice that we don't have an average that's higher than a thousand. So you can kind of see your average purchase amount based on month. So really this one just comes down to being what do we do with the extra data then now that we know how we're grouping it? Okay, so that's kind of like the order of operations from where group by having order by and then finally the select. So it kind of goes down the line and then finally ends at select. And that just depends on if you have all these. A lot of times you won't have a group by or a having clause. You may not even have an order by, you know, it may just be select from, select from where. Um, but I think it's, it helps to add context to know the order of operations because that way you can kind of see why some things have to be done the way they are. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so four types of tables. Um, there's permanent tables, which is what we see in our list over here. Um, you can kind of see like actor and, and these fall under the tables category. So these are permanent tables. So in a database, you know, naturally databases are built to be um, pretty good at storing data permanently. Um, uh, you can imagine it would be bad if they didn't do that well, because um, that's kind of their whole purpose in life is to hold data long term. Now, um, there's there's other types of data here. So the, the main tables are are permanent and you can create them, fill them with data, do whatever. And but you can't the only way to get rid of them is to actually basically delete them. So even if you wanted to kind of make a change to some of them, um, a lot of times you have to do some finagling. Like you can't recreate a table that already exists. It'll say, hey, you already have a table by this name. Um, they're very permanent things, uh, which is why they're called permanent tables. Now uh, there's a derived table and this is a table that's returned by a subquery and held in memory. Um, and I wouldn't get too crazy about this one. We don't use them a ton. Um, so, but the, the difference, I think there's a key difference between derived tables and temporary tables. So a derived table is, is the key distinction is that it's returned by a subquery. Um, so a derived table is something that we use. Um, and in fact, let me show you. So we can actually build a, a query. So I'm gonna select um, everything from customer, just like we did before, right? And that returns this row. Well, if I wrap this up, select everything from, and I put this in parentheses. Now, normally in the from clause, we have a, a table name, right? So normally we'd have a table name. Well, in this case, I'm just gonna put it I'm just putting this other query in, in parentheses. So I'm just gonna put it just like this. And if I run this, you'll notice I get an error and it says every derived table must have its own alias. And that's because, well, we just made a derived table and we just gotta give it a name. So I'm just gonna call it T for temp for now. So 
now if I run this, you'll notice that there we go. We have our, this is our derived table. And it's called a derived table because it's acting as a table in this query because we're selecting from it. So it's kind of table inception, so to speak, or, or query inception, so to speak, because we're, we're selecting from a select statement. But what's really neat about SQL that I really like is anytime you return data, it, it acts as a table. So we can always kind of keep our minds in, in this table mindset. So every query, every time we run a select statement, it's going to return a table. Um, so in this case, it's, you know, we can use this as a table because that's what's returned by the select statement. So that's a derived table. Now, a temporary table is, a, is volatile data held in memory. So, you, you, you know, I, there might be confusion. Well, isn't that a temporary table because it's, you know, they're both held in memory. Um, and a temporary table is um, something you can create with a, a, a statement. I and mean, we're not going to do it because I don't want to confuse you, but basically you can do, um, you can basically build like for a script, kind of like a temp table um, that kind of exists. And it only exists for the duration of the statement that it's working with. So just know that a derived table is, is like whenever we, you know, select from and have a subquery. And, and this little thing, anytime you have a query inside of parentheses in another query, it's considered a subquery because it's a, it's, you know, it's a subquery. It's a query within a query. And then finally, we have this virtual table, and that's um, a view. And a view is something we can create that is basically a select statement that lives on and acts like a table. So, for example, if I want to select, let's say, let's say, you know, in our customer table, we have a first name and a last name. But let's say we want to make like a table that's a little bit more user friendly um, for reporting. So let's say we want to combine those. So we're going to use a concat function and we're going to get first name, a space, and then the last name, last name, and we're going to call that full name. And then we're going to get their email. And let's just, let's just do that. And we're going to do that from customer, right? So here's our, here's our table. You can see the full name and the email. So to create a view, all I have to do is say create view v underscore customer name email. Right. We can call it whatever we want. And we just say as and we run it. Now, so now that I've ran this, all I have to do if I want that data again, I can just say select everything from v underscore customer name email. And there we go. So a view is basically like a way to save a query and have it act like a table. So it's kind of like a little shortcut, you know, if like there's something we want to do. Now views kind of serve an important purpose because let's say that we stored social security numbers, right? Or, or let's say we have some people in our company that we don't want them to see all of the email address for security reasons. Um, you know, we can, we can do that. So we can say, um, you know, substring, you know, we can kind of hide some of this column. So we can say, I want just the, um, let's say the la the first one, two, three, four, let's do the first four um, characters of our, so we we'll start at one, go four, We can do like email start. And again, so this is a good showcase of the kind of permanent stuff that happens in databases. I tried to recreate this view and you'll notice that it says that it already exists. Um, so we'd have to drop this view first, but for right now, I'm actually just going to comment this out so we can kind of see the results. All right, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say concat. Mm 
All right, so we can kind of ob obfuscate this. So you can imagine that there's social security numbers, you know, we could show the first, you know, four, what whatever they do, the last four, however it works. That way we we hide data. And so from a security standpoint, the reason we might do this is because let's say our customer service team, we don't want them to see all of the social security numbers, right? Um, so what we do is we can, um, we can create a view just like this. We create the view. And then instead of giving them access to the customer table, we only give them access to the view. And so that way they can look up people's information. And again, we're going to cover that in more detail in, in a future week. So, so it's more just so you kind of know the idea behind it. So if you didn't catch all that, that's perfectly fine. Like I said, we're going to actually spend a whole week on on most of these, so, so no worries. All right, and we kind of talked about those. It goes through a bunch of those. There we go. Okay, so aliases. Aliases are anywhere where we give a, a table a shortcut name or, or a nickname, so to speak. Um, and, you know, we already did that once with our T, but we can say, um, you know, select everything from customer C, right? And then that way, whenever we want to refer to, to customer, we can just say C within this query. Um, and kind of like how I did in this view, anytime we put as, and really we could just do as or space, um, we can give these names because a lot of times, you know, like we create something new based on the data and we want to give it like a name that's helpful. And so when we do this, you know, it'll have, basically that's where we can set our column names and those are called column aliases. And we can also do the same thing with our tables. We just put a space and then, and then the name of the, whatever nickname we want to give it. And that'll become very important as we get into later weeks when we actually use multiple tables in a single query. All right, the where clause is how we filter data. We use logic such as equal to this, greater than, less than this, those kinds of things. Um, so, and, and there's some functions we can do there. We're also, we're gonna cover this, I believe next week um, is when we go over the where clause. So, so we're gonna cover all this in depth, but just know that the where clause is how we can kind of filter data. Um, and they really evaluate to true or false. And we can stack multiple of them together using an AND operator or an OR operator. And just like in other programming languages, if we have two ANDs, they must both be true. If we use an OR, either one can be true. And as long as one is true, it, it's going to let it through. All right. And we talked about those. We talked about the order by clause. The order by clause, you can choose to sort ascending de or descending um, nothing too complex there. Okay, um, real quick, because um, we're going to come back to doing some queries um, shortly, um, if we have time. But just real quick, wanted to ask if anyone had any questions. I know that the, uh, actually, there was a question about um, keys. There's a question about keys. Um, so let's cover that real quick. And I think the question was about identifying key, uh, identifying relationships versus non-identifying relationships. Um, and this is actually a great uh, segue here. So let's uh, let's get rid of some of this noise here. Um, so I, I guess um, we're again we're going to cover this. A lot of this is just to kind of get your head wrapped around what we can do with this, um, with the select statement. So I guess is a way of kind of getting there. Um, a lot of what we're going to do with, with the select statement is we're going to join data. Because, you know, as we look at some of our tables, like customer, you'll notice that, like, we have some information here, but, but nothing really helpful, right? Like we have, well, it's helpful depending on what we're looking at, but... Like if I wanted to say, oh, you know, or let's take a look at actor. If I want to say, oh, you know, here's all of our actors, but what films are these actors in? 
you know, we don't have any information on that, but we can get it. And that's the kind of the power of these relational databases is because of what are called keys, we can connect different data together in different ways. Because sometimes we may not always ask the same question. And so we have to approach it differently and connect the data differently. But if we just wanted a list of all the movies that an actor, all the actors have been in, we have to approach this and get data from multiple tables. So, you know, we have our actor table and I'm going to give it an alias of A. And then we can join it. We can perform what's called a join. Um, and again, I don't want to get stuck on syntax because we're going to be getting to this later. But basically, I'm going to pull data from multiple places and connect them. So we have our actor table. We have a film actor table. And I want to connect these two tables together. But to do so, I have to tell it how. And so if we take a look at the film actor table. We can kind of see here that there's an actor ID and a film ID. And so we can kind of connect these together based on that key because, oh, actor has an actor ID, film actor has an actor ID. Those probably are connected. And, and so we're going to do that because we know actor one was in these films. And so to get the actor name and the film, we have to use this film actor table because it's what we call a one to many relationship, a single actor can be in multiple movies. And then finally, we want to get the list of movies. So we're going to look at film. We're just going to call that F on FA.filmID. So because we went, you know, actor has an actor ID, film actor has an actor ID. Now we want to go to film. So if we take a look at the film table, oh, hey, look, it has a film ID and there's the title of the movies and whatnot. So Film actor has film ID, so we're just going to connect those based on that criteria. The film ID from film actor and the film ID from film are going to equal each other, right? And so this is called, a, a, this is a primary key and a foreign key. So the actor ID and actor is the primary key. The actor ID and film actor is a foreign key. Now, if we take a look at film actor, You'll notice that there's not a film actor ID. There's just an actor ID and a film ID. So back to the original question of, which was asked on Teams, what's the difference between an identifiable relationship and a non-identifiable relationship? Um, from, from customer, so from actor, because we only have one of these. Um, so from, if we look at customer, select everything from customer i'm getting ahead of myself if we look at customer customer has this address id right and then if we look at address select everything from address you'll notice that it also has an address id but that's the primary key right so in this sense this is an identifiable relationship or sorry it is a let me get this straight because a identifiable relationship is when it's, I think it's when it's based on the name of the key. Let's actually Google it real fast to make sure I don't tell you wrong. Identifiable relationship sequel. Identifying relationships exist when the primary key of the parent key, parent entity is included in the primary key of the child entity. So let's take a look here in this picture. Check your book ID. Yes. Okay. So just, yes. Yeah. So in this case, in this case, this is a non-identifiable relationship from customer to address because it's address ID in the customer table. It's just kind of there. It, it has nothing to do with it because it has its own primary key. It has its customer ID is the customer's primary key. Address ID is the primary key of address, but the address ID in the customer table is not part of the primary key because it already has one. However, in film actor, you'll notice we don't have a film actor ID. 
it doesn't its primary key is actually the combination of these two so the relationship between actor and film actor is an identifying relationship because a film actor is an actor and a film combined if that makes sense so its identity is the actor in the film it doesn't have its own identity film actor id its primary key, its identifying piece of information is a combination of an actor and a film. So the actor to film actor relationship is identifiable as is the film actor to film relationship. Um, was the person who asked the question on? I can't remember who asked it. It was me. Okay, does that make sense? Um, yes. Um kind of but there's just lots of ways to describe it like some of them say that if it's if it can stand alone and exist on its own um, as an entity then it's non-identifiable so that doesn't always work in this context that you're sharing though um and it, you're basing it completely on primary keys and foreign keys but is that always going to be the case then and it really just depends on how you designed the database yes and and let me approach it this way because because both are true so like for example what would a film actor be without a film nothing right like like it couldn't in this case it actually couldn't happen because these two values make up its primary key so it would throw an error but there is no point of having a film actor row without a film because otherwise it's just an actor if that makes sense so so that's why that one's an identifying relationship because without you know for example a film actor without a film is just an actor and so it's not any it, it can't stand alone by itself however right. but but an actor still exists so so like in the example like the temple's example they they had the services and then they built the has services joining table yep to connect those two things and so um like at what point do you need the joining table to connect versus you can just directly link them great question so so really it comes down to the design and and i consider this to be business logic right so and, and, you know, you heard me mention a one to many relationship, meaning that a, an actor can be in multiple films, right? But what's interesting is a film can have multiple actors, right? Yeah. And so, so we can approach this two pronged, depending on which viewpoint are we coming from the actor's viewpoint? Are we coming from the film's viewpoint? And so you can imagine like IMDB, you know, you can click on an actor and see that the, the films they're in, but you can also click on a film and see the actors that are in the film. And so really what we have between actor and film is a many to many relationship and those can get extremely messy. And so the times when we have this, what I consider to kind of be this intermediary table um, you know, and in the temples example, they used like the has whatever, which I hate that nomenclature, to be honest, um, right. because the, the database standard is just to, to underscore the two tables names together as what we see here in like, film actor. So it'd be like temple service. Yeah, exactly. Because right. it's, it's a temple service. Um, and so anyways, we get around that by introducing this intermediary table, which really holds every combination that exists. Um, you know, so like if we take a look at film actor, we we literally have like, you know, just like this actor ID one is in a ton of films. And if we were to order this by film. We can see the inverse of that. Oh, here's film one and all the actors that are in that film. So so that's how we get around that kind of dilemma of having this many to many relationship of Oh, which, you know, we can have, you know, we, we can't have it both ways. So like if we were just to throw film ID in the, in the actor table, an, a, an actor could only be in one film, right? So like the way we're currently right. designed, a customer can only have a single address. 
but in the way we've designed film because of the film actor table a, a film can have multiple actors and an actor can be in multiple films so so anytime you have many to many you should have a joining table to allow for multiple options correct yep so then in that joining table you won't have a primary key you'll have a composite key because it will be both primary keys becoming foreign keys for the two places it's joining exactly yep and you said a word there so the composite key is spot on and it's called a composite key because it's made up of multiple columns to create the key so like in in our customer table the customer id is the primary key and it's it's simple there's just you know one two three four five on and on a composite key is when we make up a key from multiple columns so in this case act it's the combination of actor id and film id that make that primary key and the primary key is unique so we couldn't have actor id one film id one for two rows because then you know you can only record right. an actor being in a film a single time right. so the the combination of those have to be unique and that com that composition forms the primary key yep spot on great yeah it makes sense in the reading and then when you try to do the uh, project at the end everything <laughs> yes it's relearning it all again but yes thank you yeah and and just in case some people didn't follow along there don't get too hung up because like one thing i really like about the way this course is designed is it's a very step wise approach to to this um and in week four or five i can't remember which we we cover joins um and so we're gonna build up to this like if you've never heard of sql that was a lot to unpack um and we're gonna get there so again we're just trying to kind of show um and, and all are great questions because what's really hard about databases is it's always like this catch-22 um where you know to, to really like get your hands in it you have to understand some things um really on the design and concept data design kind of front which is a big focus of this week um so so really just trying to kind of build some base context here so that when we go to talk about the reverse engineering project you kind of have some context this is basically what we're getting to um so anyways great questions um and let's see we were trying to get actors and what film they're in so let's do that. So let's get the actor. And I think it's first name. And I think it's the title of the film. There we go. So if we wanted to get a list of all of our actors, what film they're in, so on and so forth, um, you'll notice that we have to do this, which is where we're, we're pulling data from many places. Um, in fact, we're pulling it from three, we're really displaying data from two tables, but again, we had to use that film actor table almost as an avenue. So I like to think about it as like little like paths, right? Um, like imagine settlers, Catan or, you know, whatever, like we're, we're building paths somewhere. And sometimes we have to make a pit stop somewhere, not because we need anything there, but it's just on our route, you know, oh, I'm using you as a, as a way to get there, so to speak. Um, I, I could make a joke about, you know, Ogden or something for me, because, you know, I never want to go to Ogden, but it's on my way to, to Salt Lake, so as an example. Um, so it's, it's by necessity. So I like to think about it as you're, as you're trying to get places, you can look for routes, right? Oh, if I'm an actor and I want to get to film, oh, look, this is film actor table. Does it have what I need? Let's, let's take a look. Oh, well, you know, it has film ID. So I can get from actor to film through film actor, right? That's kind of how I like to think about it. Kind of like building routes. And on that note, um, on that note, let's jump into our, which is a, a great kind of segue into our reverse engineering uh, project for this week. So this week, instead of doing a paper, you are going to reverse engineer a website of your choice. Um, and so basically the instructions kind of say that, uh, you know, I, I kind of ignore kind of like the, the role play stuff that goes on. So. Um, but basically we're going to, we're going to look at a website and try to kind of 
guess on how they might have built the database that stores it, right? So, so I'm going to kind of do one here real quick. And, um, and, and really, so it talks about the deliverable is, let's see, you should return a report with a Zoom video that demonstrates your design and the approach you took to create it. So, so really, this is pretty open-ended. Um, and, but really what we're trying to get to is this, um, we, we can either create a spreadsheet or an entity relationship diagram. So what I want to do is I want to show you real quick a, what an ERD looks like if you've never seen one. Um, so I'm actually going to use Sakila because it's something we're, we're kind of familiar with. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to database and I'm going to use this reverse engineer function and I'm going to just hit next, type in my password. There we go. And I want to take a look at the Sakila database. And there we go. So this is an ERD and basically what it is is each table has a list of its columns. Each table is a box and it has its columns. And then there's lines that connect it to um, those relationships. So like, for example, since we just did a lot of talking about actor and film actor and where is it? Actor. Oh, we have actor, film, actor, film. There it is. Sorry, I have a lot of stuff here that's extra. So really, we just kind of want to look at these. So we have our actor table and I can kind of hover over this and see where they connect, right? And so you can imagine this is pretty useful for someone, you know, like let's say you're coming into an existing business that already has a database and you need to, to immediately jump into doing reports. This is actually one of the first things I always request, like, oh, can I have a copy of your ERD? Um, and sometimes they'll print them out on like massive like PDFs that you can scroll around Zoom, kind of follow the, the trail around. Um, or you'll just load up the database and generate one yourself. So then you can kind of pick it apart. Um, Cause then you can say, oh, you know, I need to get from actor to film and you can see the path there, right? And sometimes there's like big circles, but most of the time you can kind of pick which way you want to go about it. And there's little symbols here. So you'll notice this symbol here, this when it just connects with two little lines, that's one. And you'll notice this thing that people call it the crow's foot. It looks like a little chicken foot or bird foot. Um, that little crow foot is a many, so one to many. And again, like we talked about, film has a one to many because an actor, a single actor can be in multiple films and a single film can have multiple actors, right? So that's um, e from here to here, it's a one to many. And from here to here, it's a one to many. And in totality, they make uh, from actor to film, it creates a many to many relationship. But the difference is, and we're going to talk about this, because we have this intermediate, intermediate table, it maintains what we call first normal form, which is means that, hey, you've done your database design job correctly. Um, so there's, there's messier ways to make it, quote, work, but it's not right. And so that's, this is maintaining like the standard kind of clean data, which is called first normal form. So this is, this is a, a ERD. Now, what I'm going to do real quick is I'm actually just going to pull up a spreadsheet. So Libre Calc, let's use Calc here. Um, so if I was going to do this on a spreadsheet, because if you don't want to create an ERD, that's perfectly fine. Um, oh, and let me show you, it is pretty easy um, in case someone wants to do it, because I actually think it's easier um, than doing than doing this, the spreadsheet to be frank. Um, so I can just go to file and do a new model. I'm gonna say, don't save. Um, and once it gets here, you can just click on this, double click on add diagram and it'll bring you to the same place. It'll just be blank. And then this little button over here, this is where you just add a table. So I can just click this, click over here and double click on it. And then you can kind of add a table. So, um, let's actually walk through both. Um, I'm going to pick a website. Um, let me think of a good one. Um, let's see, what's a good website to mimic? You know, I'm actually going to go with, 
with Canvas. We all use Canvas, right? Um, so I'm actually going to use Canvas as kind of um, an example here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a person table. And inside my person table, I'm going to have um, a person ID. And I'm going to have a first name and a last name and you can keep it simple just keep it to the to the stuff that's relevant so to speak you know so like because there's probably birthday and stuff in here and it, but like we don't need to worry about it for right now um so i'm going to do the same thing in our spreadsheet which did i get rid of it oh there it is um so in my spreadsheet i'm going to do the same thing um i'm going to create a person table And it's going to have a first name, person ID, first name, and a last name. And this is going to be a primary key, All right? Something like that. And I'm just going to put a little box around this. And where's my border button? Anyways, you get the picture. Um, I'll just bold this and highlight it. All right, so there's a person table. Um, and from there, we might have, um, I know we have courses and we have sections. So I'm going to add another one. I'm just going to do a course, click over here on columns. We're going to have a course ID. And name and a code right something like that where name would be you know database develop design and development and the code would be cit 225 225 225 yes okay so we have a course a person and i committed a cardinal sin here just kidding it's not that cardinal just so you know um MySQL is pretty agnostic to capitalization, um, depending on which flavor of database product you use, um, it changes. So SQL Server likes uppercase. Um, for the most part, everyone prefers lowercase. Um, I don't care what you use, just try to be consistent so that it makes sense. So um, I kind of prefer, MySQL kind of prefers it to be lowercase and instead of camel case, you use underscores. That's kind of, as you've seen in the database, so. Okay, so we have our course. Um, let's go back here and we're gonna add a course. Course ID. Oops. Course ID, name and code. Now you can kind of see like this doesn't seem too bad, you know, it's pretty, pretty standard, but where we, where I think the benefit comes from, from here is, so let's build, well, let's, I'm getting ahead, cart ahead of the horse here. Let's build our section core section table, section ID. And the section ID, a section is a child of a course, right? Because the section is, you know, we have multiple sections of CIT 225. Um, and every section is going to have a number. And let's just do that. And let's actually do, yeah, let's just do that. Keep it simple here. Now inside, because we're in section and we know that this actually needs, you know, we have course ID here. We need to connect that to Oh, and let's change the data type here because we need the data type to match whatever this is. Um, so we know course IDs here. We want to connect that to course. So all we have to do is click on this foreign key tab and you can just let it auto generate the name. And then we can kind of choose what we want to connect this to. So I want to connect this to course. And what is the connecting piece? Well, it's the course ID and it kind of does it for you. So there we go. It's connected. 
Um, so that's kind of nice because otherwise in the video that you make, you know, you're going to have to try to talk through this, um, you know, because we want section and section ID, primary key. We have a course ID, which is a foreign key. I'm just going to say to course. I before E, except after C, and except for when it doesn't want to be. Um, the number. There we go. So, you know, um, whatever your preference is, um, go for it. Not picky, but you can kind of see, um, you know, that's how we're going to go about building it. Um, so, finally, you know, and it doesn't have to be everything. Like I said, it doesn't have to be all inclusive. Like for me, I'm just going to kind of do like a little subset of this. And maybe that for me is I just want to show, oh, you know, how Canvas um, puts, stu puts students and teachers inside of a course, right? And so um, this is where we say, uh, it's called a roster. And inside of each roster, we have the section it belongs to, which is an int data type. And we have the person ID that it's assigned to, and that's an int data type. And again, just click on foreign keys, and I'm going to connect it to section on section and person on person. And there we go. So now you can kind of walk through how this works because, again, just like our, our other example, this is an intermediary table where we have a course that has multiple sections, so one-to-many relationship. And a section can have multiple roster records, right? And... Let's actually change the name of this. I don't like that table name because a roster, we're going to call this a section enrollment. There we go. I like that. I like that. A section enrollment. That sounds better. So we have a section and, and a section can have multiple people enrolled. And a person can be enrolled in multiple sections, right? This, we could also call this a person section, but in this case, we decided to go with a more uh, friendly name that actually describes it, which is a section enrollment. And, and so, you know, this is pretty, pretty simple. Um, you know, we could add stuff to this, like, uh, you know, we could add a start date. And an end date, you know, maybe people join the class late, so to speak, and we want to track that. So we have a start date and an end date, so on, so forth. So anyways, you can kind of get the picture. You can pick any website, whether it's, I've had people do um, the Harry Potter website. I've had people do baseball stat websites. I've had people do, do all sorts. Um, there's the LDS Meeting House website. That's a great one. Um, Meeting house locator, right? Um, this is a this is another great one you could do. Um, you know where you can punch in a ward name, um, you know, and and go find it, so on and so forth. So, um, anyways, there's a couple ideas. Um, feel free to to use whatever format you want. If you want to use Excel, that's great. If you want to use um, this, it's fine. Um, keep it simple. Um, you know, this should, this is basically the equivalent of your paper. So, you know, like if you're doing something like Canvas, I would expect it to be something of this size, more just something to kind of get your head working around, um, you know, oh, how might they have designed this? Because then you're kind of putting your shoes on the designing part without having to come up with a native or new concept. So um, really just, just kind of enough to kind of proof of concept, the base functionality um, and go from there. Um, 
but anyways that's this week does anyone have any questions about this the the reverse engineer project i know we've lost a couple people and that's fine all righty well perfect well um gone over our time um so appreciate you guys being here um hopefully this is all helpful if you have any questions feel free to let me know otherwise good luck this week and hope to uh, excited to see what you come up with for your for your project thank you much yep thank you